When acting as the pilot in command, it is that individual's responsibility to ensure that the aircraft being flown is in airworthy condition. By conducting a thorough pre-flight inspection, a pilot ensures that all aircraft documents, components, and systems are safe and properly functioning. The following lesson will demonstrate how pre-flight acceptance and inspections are conducted at Epic Flight Academy on our Cessna 172 Skyhawk aircraft. Note, while conducting a pre-flight inspection, the pilot must reference their checklists to confirm all items have been checked off before takeoff. At first, pilots will rely on the checklist to guide their pre-flight, but with experience, pilots begin doing the required pre-flight checklist line items and then confirming by reviewing the checklist. When a student pilot receives the aircraft can, a metal folder containing the keys and records for the specific aircraft, the pre-flight inspection begins. Inside the can will be the important information about the aircraft, such as the hobs and tack time, fuel and oil quantities, and maintenance status of the aircraft. It is vital to thoroughly review all documents in the aircraft's can to identify if there are any discrepancies or issues with the aircraft before approaching the aircraft. By reviewing the maintenance status, the pilot can confirm all necessary inspections are conducted and current, as well as get an idea of how the aircraft has been operating lately. After the information found in the aircraft can is deemed correct and safe, the pilot must cross-check the hobs and tack time and fuel and oil quantities with the actual aircraft to confirm proper documentation of this information is recorded. The pilot should use a fuel stick to check each wing's fuel tank quantity and write down the total fuel. Another part of the aircraft acceptance portion of the pre-flight inspection is to ensure that all the necessary documents are present and valid. This includes the aircraft's airworthiness certificate, registration, operations manuals, supplemental documents or reference guides, and weight and balance. The acronym SPARROW is used to remember the necessary aircraft documents. In EPIC's aircraft, the airworthiness certificate and registration are displayed on the left side of the aircraft near the pilot's legs. The pilot's operating manual, often called the POH, G1000 and autopilot reference guides, and weight and balance are found on the back sides of the front seats of the aircraft in the seat pouches. It is important that the airworthiness certificate, registration, and POH are specific to the aircraft which can be confirmed by matching the aircraft's tail and serial numbers with the tail and serial numbers found on the documents and manuals. After the aircraft acceptance is completed, the pilot then begins physically inspecting the systems and components of the aircraft. Starting in the cabin of the aircraft, the pilot should ensure that the parking brake is engaged to ensure the aircraft will remain stationary throughout the inspection. The parking brake is located under the left pilot's control wheel. To engage the parking brake, the pilot must push down on both brakes, which are on the top of the rudder pedals. The pilot should pull the parking brake towards themselves and turn it counterclockwise to lock the brake in position. Next, the pilot should inspect the fire extinguisher. The fire extinguisher is located between the two front seats of the aircraft and should be secured. Its pressure gauge should indicate it's adequately filled with fire retardant. The needle on the gauge should be in the green arc. And the tamper evidence seal is still secured. Moving directly forward from the fire extinguisher, the pilot then moves the fuel selector valve to the both position and ensures the fuel shutoff valve is pushed in, which means fuel will flow from the fuel tanks to the engine. Above the fuel selector and shutoff valves is the elevator trim, which should be turned up or down until set for takeoff. Next, the mixture should be pulled out, known as cutoff, to ensure that no fuel flows into the aircraft's engine while performing the outside inspection. The throttle should also be pulled out to the idle position. Moving to the left of the throttle and mixture knobs, the pilot should ensure that the alternator static air source is working by pulling the red knob out and pushing it back in. This is used in the situation that the static air source on the outside of the aircraft becomes blocked during flight. The control lock behind the left pilot's control wheel is then removed, which will allow for the flight controls to move freely during the pre-flight inspection. The panel lights then should be turned to the off position and the ignition should be in the off position. The keys should not be put into the ignition at this time to ensure there is no risk the starter could engage the aircraft's flywheel, which would turn the engine on. It is a common practice at Epic Flight Academy that the aircraft keys are put on top of the glare shield, which makes them visible to other people approaching the aircraft, indicating that the engine will not be started. 
Above the ignition are white switches called the Avionics Bus 1 and 2 master switches. These should be turned off. Next to the Avionics master switches are the red alternator and the battery master switches. The alternator master switch should remain off, but the battery master switch should be turned on. This activates the electrical system using the aircraft's main battery. After the battery master switch is turned on, the flap should be fully extended by moving the flap level to the full position. The flap lever is located to the right of the mixture knob. By extending the flaps fully, the pilot can inspect the flaps during the outside inspection of the aircraft. Next, the exterior lights and pitot heat should be turned on. These switches are located below and to the right of the alternator, battery, and avionics master switches. At this time, the pilot should walk around the aircraft and ensure that all the lights are on and functioning, as well as the pitot heat is working. The pilot should ensure that the navigation lights, a red constant light on the left wing tip, a green constant light on the right wing tip, and a white constant light on the top of the rudder, anti-collision lights, white flashing lights on each wing tip, beacon light, red flashing light on the top of the vertical stabilizer, and taxi and landing lights, white lights on the leading edges of the wings, are working. Note, some of Epic's aircraft have a separate taxi and landing light, whereas others have a combination light where both the taxi and landing light are found in one bulb. To check the pitot heat, lightly touch the pitot tube located on the wing. It should feel warm to the touch. Once the exterior lights and pitot heat are inspected, the switches should be returned to the off position. Back in the cockpit of the aircraft, the pilot should ensure that the primary flight display, or PFD, has turned on. On the PFD, the pilot should look for annunciators or warning messages in the lower right corner of the display. The pilot needs to ensure that the low fuel annunciator is not displayed, but the oil pressure, low volts, and vacuum annunciators are displayed. Now the pilot should turn on the white avionics bus 1 master switch and hear the cooling fan behind the PFD turn on and then turn the avionics bus 1 master switch off. Next, the white avionics bus 2 master switch should be turned on and the pilot should hear the aft or rear cooling fan turn on. This aft cooling fan is located behind the baggage compartment. Once the aft cooling fan is confirmed on, the avionics bus 2 master switch should be turned off. Back on the PFD, the pilot should cross-check the fuel quantity being displayed by clicking on the PFD's engine soft key then system soft key. If the quantity displayed is different from the quantity found while checking each fuel tank, make the proper adjustments to the fuel display on the PFD using the appropriate soft keys. Once the fuel quantity has been verified, turn the red battery master switch off. Now the pilot begins inspecting the outside of the aircraft starting behind the left side door. The baggage compartment door is located just behind the left side door. If objects are added to the baggage compartment, Ensure they do not exceed the placarded weight for the specific baggage areas and that the objects are secured. Then close and lock the baggage compartment and check that the baggage compartment will not open. The pilot should also inspect the skin or surface of the aircraft for any dents, gouges, or missing rivets. Moving towards the tail of the aircraft, the pilot needs to inspect the static port if the aircraft is equipped with the CAP-140 autopilot system and ensure that the static port is not blocked. Note. Not all EPIC aircraft have CAP-140 autopilots, so this step may be omitted if the aircraft is not equipped with the CAP-140 autopilot. Further along the left side of the aircraft as the pilot approaches the tail will be the external data plate. The pilot needs to ensure that the data plate is for the same model aircraft, in this case the Cessna 172, and that the serial number matches what is present on the airworthiness certificate, registration, and POH. Now the pilot needs to visually inspect the elevator control surface for any abnormalities such as dents, gouges, or missing rivets, and check that the two counterweights, four securing bolts, and four static wicks, and two bonding straps are present and secure. The pilot should move the elevator all the way up and down to ensure that the elevator stops at the high and low pitch stops and moves freely. Be sure not to grab the trim tab while moving the elevator. To inspect the trim tab located at the right side of the elevator, move the elevator up and down. The trim tab should move opposite of the direction the elevator is being moved. Also ensure that the trim tab securing bolts are present and secured. 
Under the elevator where the aircraft is tied down to the ramp is the tail skid. Ensure that the tail skid is not bent or missing and untie the tail. Next, visually inspect the rudder control surface for any abnormalities such as dents, gouges, or missing rivets, and check that the two cable shackles, three securing bolts, two static wicks, and bonding strap are present and secured. Move the rudder to the right and left, then let go. The rudder should return back to the center. On the bottom of the rudder is a ground adjustable trim tab. Ensure that it is present and secure, but do not move or bend the tab. This is adjusted by Epic's maintenance professionals and can be easily bent out of calibration, leading to unfavorable flight characteristics. Two antennas should be present at the top of the vertical stabilizer. These antennas are for the aircraft's two navigation receivers. As the pilot begins to move forward on the right side of the aircraft, they should ensure that the emergency location transmitter, or ELT, antenna is present and secure between the rudder and the rear window of the aircraft. Now the pilot should inspect the right wing by ensuring the flap is fully extended and secure, as well as the flap's rollers are in good shape and the connecting bar is secure and not bent. Note, the connecting rod should be able to be moved slightly, but not feel loose. The right aileron is inspected ensuring that all the securing bolts, counterweights, connecting rod, and static wicks are present and secure. Also, check that the connecting rod is not bent. The connecting rod should be able to be moved slightly but not feel loose. As the pilot finishes inspecting the aileron, they will find themselves at the right wingtip. They should then inspect the light shields and the wingtip for any damage or missing components. Then the pilot should check that all the underwing inspection panels are properly secured and not missing any screws. The leading edge of the wing should be carefully inspected for any dents or signs of stress. As the pilot reaches the right wing strut, they should untie the tie-down rope and inspect the air inlets along the leading edge near the cockpit. There should be no debris blocking these inlets. Moving back under the right wings, the pilot now inspects the right main landing gear. The tire needs to be checked for any bald or flat spots, dry rot, and belt exposure or separation. After the tire is inspected, the pilot must check the connection of the tire to the main gear strut by ensuring the cotter pin is present and the wheel nut is securely fastened. Then, the disc brake assembly is checked for any hydraulic fluid leaks, sufficient brake pad thickness, and disc condition. Note, hydraulic fluid is red. If there is any red fluid around the landing gear, the pilot should notify maintenance immediately. Also, brake pads should be at least the thickness of a nickel. Now the pilot needs to sump the fuel from the wing tanks. There are five wing tank sumps on the underside of the wing. It is suggested that the pilot shakes the aircraft slightly from side to side to ensure that any water in the fuel tank will settle to the bottom before sumping the fuel. Using the GATS jar located in the passenger area of the aircraft, the pilot takes fuel samples from all five sumps on the wings and inspects the fuel for any debris or water. 100 low lead aviation grade fuel is dyed blue and is lighter than water, so water will sink to the bottom of the GATS jar and will be clear. If any clear fluid is present, the pilot should notify maintenance immediately as this can lead to engine damage or failure. If the fuel sump shows no signs of water or debris, the pilot then adds them back to the fuel tank by pouring the fuel from the GATS jar into the fuel tank on the top of the wing. At this time, the pilot should also ensure that the fuel cap seal and grommets are in good condition to ensure that the fuel tank is sealed and will vent during the flight. Next, the pilot should inspect the nose area of the aircraft starting with the cabin air inlets on the right side of the aircraft's nose. This should be secured and not blocked with any debris. Then, the pilot should check the oil quantity of the engine. Epic Flight Academy requires a minimum of 6 quarts of oil to fly our Cessna 172s. If the oil is below 6 quarts, the pilot must contact Epic's fuel truck and have oil added to the engine. On the bottom of the nose, there are three more fuel sumps that need to be used to collect fuel samples. If the fuel quality is acceptable, the fuel is added back to one of the wing tanks. The nose gear is then inspected to ensure that the tire is in a safe condition. The two cotter pins and nuts that hold the tire on the nose here are present and secure. The oleo strut, shimmy damper, and steering rods are in working condition. Note: Remove the nose tie down before inspecting the health of the oleo strut. As a rule of thumb, the oleo strut should have a minimum of three fingers between the top and bottom of the strut to properly absorb the shock imposed when landing and taxiing. 
At EPIC, the nose tie-down is placed in the cockpit of the aircraft. The pilot then inspects the air inlets for the engine located above the nose gear and behind the propeller. The pilot must ensure there is no debris or blockages in the air inlets as these provide cooling for the engine. Inside the air inlet nearest to the right wing is the alternator and the alternator belt. The pilot inspects the belt for any cracks and looseness. Then the propeller and spinner are inspected for any damage such as chips, dents, or other abnormalities. The spinner is attached with screws. The pilot must ensure that all the screws are present. Below the propeller is the filtered air inlet for the engine. The pilot must ensure there is no debris in the filter and that the filter is not collapsed as this is where the engine intakes air that is used in the combustion cycle, powering the engine. On the left pilot side of the nose is the static air inlet. This provides the pedostatic instruments with static pressure, so it is vital that it is not blocked with any debris or moisture. The external power door is then opened and closed to ensure that it is properly secured. The pilot then checks all the upper and lower cowling cam locks and cowling bowl screws. These secure the cowling, or engine cover, to the aircraft, so all the cam locks and screws must be tight and present. Now the pilot inspects the left wing. They need to ensure the aileron, flaps, leading edge, wing tip, and inspection panels are all in working condition just like they did on the right wing. The pilot must also inspect the pitot tube to ensure there is no debris blocking the ram air inlet and drain hole. The fuel vent located behind the wing strut where it attaches to the wing is then inspected for debris and that it is not blocked. Note, it is normal if a little fuel is dripping from the fuel vent, but if a constant flow of fuel is coming from the fuel vent, contact maintenance immediately. The tie-down rope is then removed from the wing tie-down and the stall warning vane is checked for any debris that would not allow the stall horn to sound if the pilot were to stall the aircraft. The pilot also inspects the left main landing gear, checking the tire and brake condition the same way they did while inspecting the right main landing gear. Fuel is also sumped from the left wing's five sumps and inspected for debris or water, and then added back to the fuel tank if acceptable. The pilot also inspects the fuel cap seals and grommets to ensure that the fuel tank is sealed and will vent properly. Once all these checklist items are inspected and deemed airworthy, the pilot does one more walk around of the aircraft, observing the general condition of the aircraft, ensuring all tie downs are removed, fuel caps are secured, oil dipstick and access door are secured, and the propeller area is clear of debris. Now the pilot is ready to move on to starting the aircraft. Thorough pre flight inspection is vital to the safety of every flight. Pilots should reference their checklist during pre flight inspections to ensure all areas of the pre flight inspection are conducted properly. Remember, it is the pilot's responsibility to ensure that the aircraft is in airworthy condition before takeoff. Be sure to like our video and subscribe for more epic content. And while you're here, check out some of our more recent videos and playlists.